All right, we are seeing the numbers jumping. We are waiting for more participants to come in and we'll be begin shortly. Okay, so let's begin. Good afternoon and good evening, depending on which time zone you are. My name is Miko and I'm from the marketing department at ASAC Asia Pacific. We are thrilled to see many of you uh, to be able to join us today at our postgraduate festivals 2023 faculty showcase. Without further ado, to start with our faculty showcase, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Sonia Prokopak, Associate Dean of Faculty, Asia, ASEC Asia Pacific. The floor is yours, Professor. Thank you, Miko. Uh, so hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here and to share uh, uh, a little bit about what I do and my area of expertise with you. Uh, so I will uh, just share uh, some slides uh, to, to make the process more visual. Uh, because you will see something that is a uh, part of my area of expertise actually um, uh, is a lot more interesting with images. So, uh, so I'll share now. Um, can um, is that is that uh, visible? Yes, it is. Great. Uh, so yes, so I'm a professor of marketing. Uh, I am. I have been with ESSEC for 15 years, uh, six and a half years uh, have been in Singapore campus. And um, uh, even though my main area of expertise is, um, well, it's quite broad it, within consumer insights, consumer behavior, um, I have uh, over the years specialized in, um, in uh, basically working with the luxury industry and really understanding uh, how to manage uh, luxury brands. Um, and this area is uh, uh, very interesting because it's, even though luxury industry is a very large uh, industry uh, with the many leading global brands now uh, in the world, um, it's also an industry where a lot of insights can be drawn from and uh, can apply to really strong branding practices. So this is how I approach this subject and how I teach it and how I um, work with companies that are basically looking to premiumize uh, their branding, to premiumize their experiences, or with companies that are targeting uh, luxury clients and need to understand how these clients behave, what they think, and uh, what they like, right? So, so that's the approach. So even if you're, for example, in an area which is not within the luxury field, um, you can still find a lot of really interesting takeaways in terms of how luxury brands are managed. So uh, one of the uh, fundamental principles comes down to the branding, uh, branding pillars of brand, or the framework that is utilized in luxury brands, even brands uh, in the fragrance industry, for example, in the makeup industry, like you have here on the left, and some of the FMCG uh, brands that we have on the right, which still can have very strong branding, uh, marketing activations in place, but don't necessarily follow the same rules um, as, um, as luxury brands follow. Okay, so usually within the luxury brand uh, management, we'll say that there are six key differences or pillars uh, in terms of how to manage luxury brands. But because this is a short masterclass and I won't have time to develop all of these, I will just focus on three pillars that are, that are interesting to start with. Um, so one of the first pillars uh, comes down to really the fundamental uh, that you need to consider when you are thinking about premiumizing your brand is the brand DNA. And I, I'll start with this example because I think this example resonates uh, with, uh, with a lot of people. <laughs> so imagine these are two cups of, um, of champagne um, and they represent two brands. Uh, and usually in, in a more interactive format, 
um, I would ask, well, you know, uh, what brand do you think is on the left? And what brand do you think is on the right? Um, and uh, the, the audience, you know, will do some guesses. They might, you know, they might try to guess, but at the end of the day, unless you are able to taste it, and even in that case, unless you are really an expert in champagnes, most of the time we will not be able to tell. Right. So how do you then decide once you are in the supermarket or in the specialty store, how do you decide which which brand you should go for? It really comes down to that branding element and that branding in the world of champagnes, in the world of wine and spirits is some of the most sophisticated branding in the world, because fundamentally the product itself is no different it might be some nuances and maybe the experts will say there are substantial differences. Uh, but to an average consumer, the ever, these, these, these uh, the, uh, differences are really uh, non, uh, not visible, right? So, so this is the first pillar of this brand DNA is really the fundamental luxury, strong luxury brand management. So what is this brand DNA? Well, the, the brand DNA is the same way we as humans have DNA um, and they've defined who we are. The, the same thing you can think about it in a branding concept. So it is, um, it is really what differentiates the brand, but how it's different in the luxury world is that it's not just one or two components because that's, that's very limiting in terms of how you can define your brand but it's actually more rich than that. The brand DNA is defined as usually four multidimensional elements that are uniquely combined. And these four elements can come from brand origins, from specific know-how, um, from heritage, from the founder, uh, from the craftsmanship, the specific craftsmanship that the brand might possess or, or specific values that the brand holds. So there is not a, a, a mathematical formula to it, but there is still a, a, some, a, a very methodical approach in how you would define a brand DNA. It can be linked to the founders, uh, uh, founder himself or herself, to the culture, to the place of birth. Um, to the brand concept, as I said, really the uh, where these four elements come from, uh, there are many possibilities. What is key here is that these four elements combined are unique to your brand and no other brand. And this idea of uniqueness is very um, strongly present in luxury brand management. There is no positioning by comparison. There is only positioning by uniqueness. So at the end of the day, this brand DNA is like a trunk of a tree and you are deciding how wide and how the tree should look like before you express it uh, to your consumer. Okay, so it's really a defines the strategy and dictates everything that you should do, but it also dictates what you shouldn't do. Okay. So if I'm giving you an example of one element uh, of a uh, of, uh, brand DNA of Louis Vuitton. One of the elements of brand DNA of Louis Vuitton is art of travel. And this comes from the historical, uh, basically beginnings of the brand and why this art of travel is so fundamental to the brand of Louis Vuitton is because the founder himself was, a, his first job was a packer he was packer for the wealthy at the time. This was in 1800s. And he was, um, his first job before even starting to create trunks was to pack the wealthy. So he really understood the needs of the, um, of the, of the, his customers at a time. And then he started creating trunks, which were addressing, uh, the needs of the wealthy, right? So this idea of travel and art of travel was really inherent to the brand at the very beginning. And the brand took that element as something that really defines the strategy uh, in terms of what they do, 
but also in terms of how the brand expresses themselves. Okay, so not just referring to the products, even though you see here images of products like trunks, like luggage, um, like um, bags uh, and handbags, but also to um, to you know to the way that the the visuals that you that you see that are expressed what the brand is about. And so um, in that regard, uh, this leads to the second point of what is unique about luxury brand management is this idea of brand codes, okay? So I spoke about brand DNA briefly and brand DNA is something abstract. It's not visible, but it is something that has to be as a, a, a known by all employees of the brand and really part of the brand uh, strategy, okay? Now, how do you express that brand DNA is through two ways. The first way is the visual identity, which is expressed through the brand codes. And this is really how you implicitly brand your products through these visual codes that are also linked to the DNA an expression of the DNA, but visible expression. Okay. And the second element that I will speak about in a couple of minutes is storytelling. Okay. So the stories you tell about your brand, about the codes, about the history. Okay. So what is interesting here is that the, um, here this branding via codes or visual codes is really implicit. It is not something meant to like logos, even though logo is a code, but these are much more uh, subtle elements of branding where you are, um, where your products are recognizable from the position of cultural capital, as opposed to, you know, through um, mass uh, visibility, like, like, for example, logos or large scale brand names. So I'll give you some examples, because I know it can be sometimes challenging, right? So shape. Shape is a code. It's a visual code. You can often brand through shape. If you look at these um, in, a, in a normal in a session, we would be uh, interactive session. I would be asking you if you know these brands. Um, but uh, um, here you have, you have codes like, uh, like Shape, which work really well in uh, perfumes and uh, fr fragrance uh, sector. Uh, like here you have Jean-Paul Gaultier, that is a recognized uh, perfume uh, um, shape. Uh, then you have Celine uh, that has many it bags that have been recognizable through the specific unique shape that they have. You have a uh, Remoa uh, that is um, that is a luggage company that has a very recognizable uh, shape as well as um, a kind of architectural um, uh, shaping on the on the suitcase itself. Um, in terms of the, the uh, bottom label that you see, this is for a brand Dom Perignon, and it is a unique shape of the label that you can uh, recognize um, in the, uh, that you can recognize even if you, uh, um, if you don't know the brand. And finally, you have here a bottle of Hennessy Cognac, which is also a very unique shape. Um, I see here a question from Kanishka that says, is the company motto a part of the brand DNA or brand code? Uh, no, uh, brand motto is uh, not uh, uh, part usually of a DNA. It could be focusing on uh, uh, something to express uh, the, the part of the brand that you want. Uh, but brand motto is usually not, um, not a part of the DNA. Uh, it is also not a code, okay? Codes are visible. So they are usually visible or they are sensorial. So they might be a smell or a certain a texture, uh, but, uh, um, but it's usually, usually what you see, what you visually see, okay? So that's, that's the code. Okay, uh, some other examples um, is here you have uh, um, examples of prints. Prints are a very good example of a code. You have here Emilio Pucci, and then you have Goyard, and then you have Dior. 
And these are prints which are, of course, unique to the brand. So codes definitely have to be unique to the brand. They cannot be um, related to the category. Some other examples I can share with you, even though there is a lot more, is uh, packaging and color. So color is an important code, uh, probably the most uh, popular code that you will see. Uh, but definitely not the only one. So you have, for example, Lobuta uh, as a bottom of the shoe, the red, red on the bottom of the shoe. Tiffany's with the Tiffany blue. This is a color that actually patented and protected by Tiffany. So no other brand can use it. Um, black and white by Chanel. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, then we have the red of Cartier the jeweler, and the orange uh, as a color of Hermes. Besides the color, oh, I, I think I don't have uh, more images, but I can, you know, for example, it could be an animal, uh, like Bulgari uh, uses the code of Serpenti, a snake. Um, there is a bee or of a Gucci. Uh, there is a panther of Cartier. Um, so, uh, so uh, there could be metal, um, certain metal shapes uh, or um, uh, hardware that you use uh, as a brand code. So really the possibilities are quite vast. It comes down to the fact that is it visible and is it recognizable as something unique only linked to your brand, right? And the last element, and I will very, share it very quickly because I only have a couple of minutes left, but it's important for you to um, understand the, the 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 three elements together is as I said you have the brand DNA and that DNA is brand DNA is internal yeah? so for example art of travel uh, is combined with the DNA of exceptional quality of products um, and two other elements of Louis Vuitton. It is expressed through the visual codes, like in Louis Vuitton, you have the monogram, you have the damier, you have the uh, uh, certain buckles, gold buckles that they have. So you have a, at least six to eight different codes that they utilize. You have certain colors that they have. And as at the same time, you have the storytelling that is uh, that comes and with the brand and that is really embedded into the products and into the brand experience. These things are not separate. They're not uh, a separate part of the brand. They're all embedded together to create the brand universe that many customers around the world admire um, want to buy into and are extremely loyal to, to these brands. Right, So this dream that the brands create in the luxury universe is very strong. So the last, uh, 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 the last pillar here is the storytelling, which gives this link among the products and really creates a complete lifestyle. Here, a great example is Dior. Dior is entirely built around the vision that Christian Dior, the designer, had for uh, for his um, for the, for the women, and so the DNA is the vision that Christian Dior had himself. Now, what's interesting is the story is a myth because he died a long time ago, but the brand is built around his, his views and his uh, vision of femininity. So you have many codes in the, in the brand. Uh, and I will show you how those codes are actually not just randomly chosen, but they are actually really built and inspired from uh, the life of Christian Dior, right? So let's say, you know, so here you have, these are all the codes on this bottom. Some of them are very frequently seen codes. Some are less frequently seen, but they nonetheless are very important to the brand. Um, and so I'll give you an example uh, of his um, uh, some of the things that uh, that we know about Christian Dior is that um, it, this story is all around his creations and his vision of femininity. It, uh, it many elements are chosen from his life or his tastes, his decorations. Uh, his likes and dislikes. Um, and uh, he, for example, loved gardens and he loved flowers. His favorite flowers were roses and lilies. So those are the codes that the brand uses. Uh, then, for example, he was very superstitious. Uh, so he um, he believed in the stars and the planets and, and um, needed to make sure that all the stars are aligned. So so because he was so superstitious the, the um, and he 
he created his Dior house after finding a star in the street. Uh, the star itself is a code of the brand. So you can see that you can't actually separate the code from the story uh, and the story from the code. And, and they are a way to express the brand DNA. Um, and the last example I will share with you is that here you see an example of a code and how that code, what is the story that is associated with and how that code uh, is embedded into the product design, right? So this is, for example, a code called Canage. This Canage was a major code for Dior for many years. They've just um, more recently uh, stopped using it as the main code because it was almost too um, frequently used. And where did this code come from? It came from the inspiration he had uh, because he saw this print on the chairs of the first show uh, that had this, this uh, motif. So the code has been used in handbags, but it's also been used in sneakers, in fragrance bottles, in fine watches, in shoes, in accessories, in makeup, and even fine jewelry. And it allows the brand products to be connected into the same universe. And also, um, it's something that is really inherently Dior because it is based on this inspiration. So, um, so yeah, so this is a little bit about um, the, some of the key uh, notions of, of uh, luxury brand management. I don't know if you have any uh, more questions. Um, let me just check. Uh, then we'll end my slides here. Thank you very much, Professor Sonia. That was a very great overview of brand DNA, luxury codes, and again, the power of storytelling. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, uh, we move on to our next session. For our next session, I am pleased to introduce Professor Arijit Chatterjee, Professor of Management. Hi, Professor. Yes, over to you. Thank you, Professor Sonia. Hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Arijit Chatterjee. I'm a professor of management at our Singapore campus. Um, I've been at ESSEC for about uh, 13 and a half years and I have uh, a few slides to present. Uh, uh, I'll talk about uh, ESSEC's guiding uh, pedagogical philosophy, which is uh, learning by doing. I'll share a few slides with you. So let me uh, do that. Okay. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. Let me uh, maximize them. All right. So, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. one thing is about learning in the classroom, and the other one is about, you know, learning uh, by doing things by yourself. And uh, here, uh, you know, I'll just show you um, a typical session in a largely case-based uh, course. Uh, uh, and uh, I used to teach the strategy course, which my friend Sam Kerg, uh, professor at ESSEC, will talk about in a minute. Uh, but in a typical session that is largely case-based, uh, each session has a theoretical reading and a case study. And these go as complements, uh, like toothbrush and toothpaste, not as substitutes. Okay, so uh, typically you'll have the case discussion in the in the first half, uh, followed by uh, a discussion of some theoretical framework, uh, some presentation in the second half. And the best way to learn in these uh, sessions is to prepare before class and participate in class. Uh, and if you do not prepare and participate, nothing happens. Okay? So a lot of your friends' learnings in the classroom will depend on what they learn from uh, you as a, as a, as a peer. Um, so that is also reflected in how students are evaluated. Uh, I'm, I'm just saying this doesn't happen uh, in uh, happens in, in used to happen in some of my courses. It may not happen in another course, but uh, if it is largely case-based and uh, you know, it will have a large component of uh, evaluation in uh, for class participation. So just uh, turning up in the classroom is not enough. You have to participate. 
you can see in this course, 30% is based on class participation. Um, so the case method, you know, I mean, there are, uh, it's not the same as sort of, you know, passive listening, uh, sitting and attending lectures. Uh, you get uh, what you give. Um, and if you, as I said, if you prepare and participate, you add to everyone's learning in the classroom. And if you do not prepare, you ruin the environment for everyone. Okay? So if, if you land up in the classroom without any preparation. And uh, there's no right or wrong answer, but there are reasons for them. Um, and uh, you are typically asked this question, you know, what would you do if you were in this situation? So you have to put yourself in the shoes of that protagonist, that manager, or that chief executive, or that top management team member. And you have to think about, well, if I am put in this situation, what should I do? Um, so uh, we'll, of course, discuss the case facts, but you have to back up your decisions with credible reasons, uh, as managers actually do in their daily lives. They come to meetings, and they use logic and evidence to convince their colleagues, their subordinates, and their superiors. So that's what you will do, and you'll get some practice in, in, in this, uh, you know, managerial practice in, in, the, in the classroom. Uh, so the case method, you know, uh, it, 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 it moves from contextual familiarity to conceptual clarity. It's not the other way around. So uh, you, you get yourself... Uh, uh, sort of, uh, you know, embedded, sort of immersed in the details of the case, the narrative, the, the numbers, and from there, you try to extract, uh, you know, some really uh, good reasons of taking up certain decision, and you try to extract some clarity, some conceptual clarity from, from the situation. But I would like to emphasize that uh, business is a science of the specific, and there are no hammers looking for nails. There's a whole reason why we want to emphasize this learning by doing philosophy. Now, what I want to share with you are two examples from the Master in Management program. I am the Associate Academic Director of, the, of this program in Singapore. Um, so here we have two courses. The first one is uh, the junior consultant experience. It is for those students who have a prior degree and they join us in the month of September. And uh, it goes on for over a, a period of um, close to uh, three months. So uh, it, uh, I'll come to the structure in a minute, but the objective is uh, complementing what students are learning in the classroom and applying those that learning with in, in the field. So uh, as they are attending during this course called the JCE in short, students are also sitting in other courses. Uh, we call them refresher courses, uh, courses in marketing, in finance and accounting, in supply chain, in, in, in organizational behavior, various courses. And uh, what they get through this JCE experience is uh, how to manage expectations of internal and external stakeholders working in a team and behaving professionally. Um, I'll, I'll skip this slide. I'll move over to the JCE journey. So as I said, the students are taking these courses. You can read on the screen. At the same time, in phase one, which is going on for about six weeks, um, they uh, are attending, they, they have a client who has a particular problem and they are attending that problem. They're trying to come up with some solutions, some recommendations, um, which are feasible. And uh, during this entire process, they're getting regular feedback from uh, professors at ESET, from external consultants, and of course, from the client. Um, we organize, uh, presentation workshops during this time. And we also organize uh, guest lectures by consultants from uh, IBM, BCG, McKinsey. And at the end of these six weeks, uh, there is a jury where the students present their recommendations in front of uh, the client, the professor, and uh, another external uh, stakeholder. Uh, after this phase one is over, the students uh, launch their own project because in phase one, 
the execution of the solution is left to the client. But in phase two, students uh, approach a particular problem and they also execute it uh, at the end of four weeks. And what we call a BYOP or build your own project. There's also a jury where the students present the problem, they come up with a solution and they also execute uh, the solution. Now, of course, um, no client will allow the students to execute uh, the, the, the solution in their, in their uh, premises or in their management. So we allow the students to do it, to try out their ideas uh, in our campus at ESSEC Asia Pacific. I'll give you some examples of, of these uh, projects the students did. So typically, the students are in a group of five to six, uh, uh, and uh, that this is evaluated by uh, SX stakeholders. Um, how we evaluate the students is, uh, did they come up with any appropriate methodology? Did they address the client's problem adequately? Did they benchmark the quality of their work? Did they produce workable recommendations? Uh, did the schedule meetings carefully? Because time management is uh, paramount in, in consulting. And also how they worked together well with, with diligence. Um, I'll skip over this slide, but throughout this process, the students get a sense of how to behave professionally and how to manage expectations of, of, of their clients. Uh, I'll skip over this slide as well. Uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, move on to another deck of slides where we where I talk about uh, the Asian strategy consulting project, which I also supervise. Um, you can see my slides, I hope. Yeah, so uh, unlike the JCE, where the students uh, uh, take part while they are attending other courses in the classroom, during the ASCP or the Asian Strategy Consulting Project, the students exclusively work on consulting. They don't do anything else. They only do consulting during these three months. And this is a much more, uh, much more, uh, 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 dedicated uh, three months uh, to consulting. And in this case, we work with Capgemini Invent, uh, Capgemini's uh, consulting arm. And um, here again, the team comprises of four to five students, um, real business issues uh, this, the, over a period of three months from late September to mid December. Um, it happens in our uh, headquarters Asia Pacific headquarters in Singapore. Um, there's one consultant who works uh, as a mentor throughout these three months. And there's one faculty supervisor, uh, one ESSEC professor who also supervises the student team. Uh, this is the structure of the ASCP. I I'll, I'll end in a minute. Uh, late September to mid October is the first half, phase one. After that, there's a pre-field work jury. Phase two, the students typically visit client sites. They could be anywhere in, in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, South Asia, or in the Far East. And the third phase, the students come back to Singapore and consolidate what they found and what the recommendations are and make a final presentation in front of the jury. Um, I'll skip over these slides, but as I said, there is a dedicated uh, coach, consulting coach who mentors the students throughout this journey and also one as a professor who uh, supervises the academic content of, of, of the student's work. Um, so as I said, uh, this is the timeline. Typically we launch in early September, ends in mid-December, okay? And there are two juries and uh, one um, two-week consulting course in the beginning, which is uh, uh, focused on how should a consultant approach onboarding, how to behave professionally and how to deliver and also how to man manage expectations of your client. Okay, I'll stop here and uh, feel free to ask any questions you might have in the chat. Thank you very much, Professor Arijit. Um, amazing tips. Such a nice sneak peek also into our master's in management program. Definitely something to look out for. Thank you, Professor Arijit. And now um, let us all welcome Professor Sam Garg, Associate Professor of Management here at Essex Asia Pacific. Over to you, Professor Sam. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Essex virtually. So I'm Sam, and uh, I do teach the core strategy 
at, at strategy and management at um, SAC in the MIM program and, and several other programs. And uh, yes, as Professor Ariji said, as you said, that, you know, um, strategy course, we put you in the shoes of a protagonist and sort of you have to take some decisions. Um, so I thought what I'll do is uh, I'll tell you why you would come to SEG because you would get some original knowledge that you will not get somewhere else, okay? So you can have a canned strategy course uh, wherever you might go, but you will see that there is actually solid research behind uh, this stuff. So my uh, some of my work is on how to make venture CEOs more effective. And by venture, I mean venture capital bag, technology, entrepreneurship uh, firms, okay? So uh, one thing is, you, you know, you think about uh, ventures, once you've raised money, I don't know, $50 million, $100 million, you have to uh, actually hire senior executives. And there is an example of Mark Zuckerberg, um, you know, hiring uh, Sheryl Sandberg and they work together effectively. But what people don't know is that she was actually probably number four executive. The other three were fired within one month because they couldn't really make this relationship work. So actually what often happens is you have to work with these uh, newly hired executives closely who are often much older than you, much more experienced than you. Um, but it also, you know, you also have conflict and you can have conflicts over anything and they can cause stalemate. Right. You really can't move, and this is really very bad for uh, new ventures. Okay, um, so what we ask is how do venture CEOs effectively resolve these conflicts with new professional executives, senior professional executives? How do we look at this? We study top fintech ventures uh, in the region, in Hong Kong specifically, uh, very closely to understand these stalemate conflict episodes, right? What works, what doesn't work? And, you know, originally, although we started thinking about uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg kind of situation, uh, what we'll find is that there are three types of conflicts. So one is the horizontal conflict, okay? Uh, your conflict with a peer executive. So you're a salesperson, uh, you're a new executive, and you might uh, have a conflict with a technology person. Or the second type of conflict is with the CEO. Uh, so you're a senior executive reporting directly to the CEO, but you know a lot more than this 25 year old CEO who owns the company or, or bulk of it. So, you know, there is a tension there. And there's a third one, which is the early staff who knows the CEO directly. Okay, so there's, there's a downward conflict. The very first thing we discovered is actually, you know, it's not just the one conflict with the CEO, but the three types of conflict. And if you are a founder CEO or you're one of these uh, three other uh, types of executives, then you need to figure out uh, what to do so that, that you can resolve the conflict and the company can move on. Um, so we actually developed a framework, kind of, I think, very interesting. Mostly when we think about uh, conflict resolution, usually you have the idea, let's sit together, have an open discussion. Or the other extreme is the CEO basically says, look, thank you very much for discussing this. You're fighting too long, but I'm going to decide, okay? Turns out actually those two options are really terrible options, both in horizontal conflict and vertical type of conflict. In fact, what works, we identified two things, private mediation and structural crafting. Let me tell you kind of for 30 seconds what private mediation is. So if you're fighting with your peer executive, it's a bad idea for a CEO to say, let's all three of us discuss together. What you find works well is actually when the CEO goes to one executive, privately discusses, helps him take the perspective of the other party, goes to the other side, does the same thing, and then sends both of them together to talk between themselves, okay? Uh, that's what we found is the best configuration. Interestingly, this doesn't work when you're actually, for example, fighting with your underlings and you're a new executive, right? Similarly, what we found what works for uh, uh, vertical conflicts, what we call structural crafting, and I won't go into that uh, now, um, doesn't actually, uh, is, is not useful in horizontal conflict. 
Now you think about what I'm talking is really CEO managing uh, the, the executives. Now what also happens uh, when you have raised so much money, you have to have a board of directors and you actually have to manage these people. So these are investors, but some of them basically are sort of your bosses. They can fire you. Um, and the rosy picture that's painted in, in, uh, in the press is of a uh, really very cute CEO board relationship. Everyone is happy and they cooperate and things go well. Um, but turns out that this actually doesn't happen. You expect the board to help you with their advice, their connections. And this is a quote from a very senior seasoned person from Silicon Valley. He says 70 to 80% add negative value, negative value to a startup, okay? So the core value proposition of venture capital is we add value. And the people I'm telling in Silicon Valley, the 80% of them don't do add positive value. So what do we do here? So I studied uh, multiple ventures in Silicon Valley and actually really traced them for three years. I sat in the board meetings. I would conduct interviews before and after the board meeting. So basically, nobody can do impression management. I can say I saw this thing. I was there. Um, and then what we do is, you know, develop a framework. Now, you know, if you if you come to SX and you will see this kind of uh, really original framework. This is, by the way, the first time anybody really, one of the first times anybody systematically studies the years and boards by sitting in the board meetings, so knowing the board process. Right? So it's the first time the systematic list is done. And so, so there, is, there is this thing, uh, when you come to SEC, I'll be happy to teach and elaborate more on these things. Uh, the final thing I want to say in uh, a few minutes I have is these ventures actually uh, aspire to go and become public listed firms, right? So think about Uber, Airbnb, uh, Alibaba, whatever it is, all major tech firms, they want to go public. Now, when you go public, you have to have independent directors, very different from venture directors. But then you have to have these independent directors and board committees. So you have to select the chairs. So how do you do that is a kind of a sociopolitical process. And turns out, when you don't give seats to those who deserve it by their qualifications, which are evaluated on 13, 14 different metrics, people feel insulted, people feel slighted. So an example is, you know, you go, you're having, uh, uh, I don't know, a lunch and you invite uh, two, three very senior executives, I don't know, see of Goldman Sachs, and you put him at the back of the room uh, with uh, some undergrads. Uh, and uh, not with the, the VIPs in the room. They're not going to feel happy. They feel uh, undervalued. And so that is, the, that is the idea. So how do people feel after being on the board? And the idea is that will affect how they contribute or not contribute. And, and so what we find is this board undervaluation is really quite a remarkable thing because it's, it's a very strong indicator of board dysfunction. And we have multiple papers on this, some published and some in the pipeline. And we look at more than 300 IPOs, technology IPOs in the, in the US. And we find that we have, when you have board undervaluation, you actually lead to these directors leave, the CEOs get fired, the new directors you hire are actually to be less good than the existing ones because the existing ones want to have a relative higher standing. And for example, number four is very interesting. And when the CEO knows that you have, there is a dysfunction on the board, they're actually likely to engage in greater accounting manipulation. Now, this has very important implications for, first of all, for CEOs and boards to know how to structure for long-term success, not just at IPO, but also for investors, not in defining good IPOs for stock exchanges, for regulators. All of them have been talking about board independence, diversity, and research shows that actually does not predict these outcomes very well, and we find a new driver of, uh, of these outcomes. So, so what it is here in a nutshell really is uh, how do you make venture CEOs effective with the management team, with their boards, and also when you go public?
So I'll stop here and uh, thank you very much for, uh, for attending uh, the session. Thank you, Professor Sam. Indeed, a very timely topic to look forward to here at Essex Asia Pacific. Thank you very much, Professor Sam. So um, before I introduce the next professor, I would like to share with everyone that there's two parallel sessions on ESSEC programs after this webinar. You will find more information via the ch chat box. And now, next in line is Professor Jameis Lim, Associate Professor of Economics. Over to you, Jameis. Hi, my name is Jameis, and I am an Associate Professor of Economics here in ESSEC Business School Asia Pacific. And I'm here to share with you a little bit about Asia's emerging markets, especially from an economics perspective. Now, for us to truly understand Asian economies, I think it's useful for us to take a step back in time and to ask ourselves where Asian economies used to be and where they are today. Let me do so by giving you a couple of pictures, and I think these pictures help to illustrate just how far a number of these Asian economies have come. What you see here is downtown Tokyo after uh, the firebombing at the end of World War II. Now, what not many people realize is that at the end of World War II, while most of us think about Hiroshima or Nagasaki and the nuclear bombs that were dropped there, Tokyo underwent a much more severe um, destruction process, and, and that, that was the result of, as it turns out, firebombs. Of course, looking at this picture, you would imagine that it wouldn't be possible for Tokyo to recover from this enormous shock. But what you see here is Tokyo in 2007. And you'll notice, of course, that for any of us that have been there, Tokyo has more than completely recovered from what has occurred. Indeed, Japan, about five or ten years after the devastation that was wrought by the Second World War, completely transform its economy and today it is the third largest economy in the world having recently been displaced by China. And speaking of China, what you see here of course is downtown Shanghai. China had been for much of the long, millennial long history in Asia was a relatively wealthy country. A little bit of that can be seen here in downtown Shanghai, where you'll see the Bund, which is this, uh, the edge of the Huangpu River. If you cast your eye to across the river, where you'll see essentially um, what looks to be mud flats and a swampy area. Now that's Putong. For many of us that have been to Shanghai in recent times, you would also know that Putong has completely transformed itself. This is the view from Putong today. And as you can see, Putong is not only the financial center of Shanghai, but in many ways, the financial capital of the nation of China. Are these two success stories limited to just the large economies in Northeast Asia? Well, not quite. Here's downtown Seoul in 1951 during the Korean War. And as you can see, much of it is unimpressive by many standards, and it looks very much like what you might expect a developing country to look like. And in the 1950s, Korea was indeed uh, very much a developing country. What then happened was that Korea, together with countries like Taiwan, along with the city-states of Singapore and Hong Kong, became the newly industrialized economies. And what did that look like? Well, here is downtown Seoul today, a vibrant, thriving metropolis. Korea is today among the largest economies in the world. And of course, most of us know that that impressive success story occurred in just a span of 40 years. This is being gradually replicated all over other parts of Asia. Here's a picture of Kuala Lumpur in the 1950s before independence. Of course, today Malaysia is still an upper middle income country and in some ways it has been trapped 
a little bit by what economists call the middle income trap, where it's unable to break free from upper middle income status to get into a high income status. But nevertheless, if you look at the capital, Kuala Lumpur, you'll see that it is in many respects a very impressive skyline, including some of the most modern uh, buildings. And of course, Malaysia boasts an industry that is competitive by global standards. And while it is still only an upper middle income country, it is a sign of the remarkable progress that the country has made just over the past half century. An even faster rate of growth can be observed in if you look further west in Asia. What we today call the Middle East, but what through most of history was called West Asia. This is downtown Dubai in 1980, just before uh, there was a remarkable transformation of its economy as the family there, the ruling family there, made a decision to reinvest much of its oil proceeds into developing the city. That road that you see there, that dusty road, is what is today Sheikh Zayed Highway. And is plied, in fact, by Maseratis and Ferraris and all sorts of expensive cars, in part because Dubai today is a financial center for West Asia and the region. And it has likewise managed to extricate itself from development status, from developing status, into becoming a impressive and modern economy. Many of us, of course, also know uh, this scene, which depicts Boat Key in Singapore. If you have been to Boat Key in recent times, you'll see that it's now surrounded by high rise buildings and extremely modern downtown core. And of course, Singapore itself, the country where we are having this uh, conversation, has become, in the span of just one or two generations, a first world country, having been just a third world country as recently as the time of independence in 1965. What is the common thread that binds all these economies together? And what are the differences? Well, of course, the truth is Asia is an extremely diverse place. The pictures that I showed you illustrate high income countries like Japan and the newly industrialized economies, as well as the Gulf Cooperation Council countries, countries like Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and of course the UAE, that have managed to completely transform their economies in a very short period of time to become high income countries. But there are also, sometimes what we forget, uh, economies that are not as far ahead. China is a good example. Although if you look in the coastal cities, like in Beijing or Shanghai or Tianjin or in Hong Kong, you clearly observe modern, globally competitive cities. It is also the case that if you look at other parts of the country, in the inner provinces and in the countryside, you will also notice that China still has quite a way to go. It aspires by 2030 to attain upper uh, high income status, but as of now, it still is at the border of what would be upper middle income and high income status. And of course, as I mentioned early on, there are these new wave industrializers, the so-called tiger economies like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, that held so much promise in the 1970s and, to be fair, had multiple spurts of rapid growth, but were never somehow able to break free from this upper middle income trap. And of course, although the world's now fifth largest economy, by some metrics the fourth largest economy, India, is indeed the next emerging giant. It is also important to remember that India itself has many pockets of poverty, especially in the northeast of the country. And there are much, many areas in the Indian economy that continue to exhibit dysfunction, dominance by a small number of large business houses in the economy, or a still nascent financial system. But 
Beyond India, of course, other parts of Asia, North Korea, Nepal, Bangladesh, these are some of the world's poorest nations. The bottom line is that India is, like the rest of Asia, extremely diverse within it, but also Asia itself is extremely diverse. Here's a way to look at Asia from the perspective of the most successful economies. You can see Japan becomes uh, somewhat distorted in the map. And part of the reason why we see this distortion is precisely because it has grown disproportionately and it now has high uh, GDP relative to other countries which occupy, of course, much larger land masses, countries in Latin America or countries in Africa, but nevertheless uh, are underrepresented in the global GDP picture. Unsurprisingly, you also see that as much talk as we give to China and India, these do not still uh, represent their geographic borders. And part of the reason for that is because these countries still have quite a way to catch up to global standards uh, in high income countries. Now, part of what drives this diverse performance in economics is of course the diverse institutional structures and histories of these countries. These countries have pursued very very different strategies for development. Some have become much, have adopted much more market oriented and business friendly approaches. Countries like Hong Kong, which is routinely cited as one of the most laissez-faire economies in the world, together with Japan, have adopted much more of a western style um, industrialized capitalist model that of course has been adapted in their own ways to their own specific idiosyncratic situations. At the same time you see much more centrally planned economies. Sometimes looking at China we forget that the state capitalism that it pursues occurs over an overlay of what we will call uh, still very much a socialist enterprise. And finally in between, you'll see all the other Asian countries that have pursued different degrees of central planning of economic control. Countries like India, that up till recently had been a socialist nation. French Indochina, many of these are in transition from their communist past. And of course, if you look at the dominance of the state in economies such as South Korea or Singapore, especially during their rapid growth phases, you will realize that many of the experiences of Asian economies can be characterized by a diversity in their institutional and development strategies. And of course, we also know that these countries have had diverse political histories. Virtually every economy in Southeast Asia, save one, which is Thailand, has had a history of colonization. And beyond that colonization history, we also know that there are more, much more communist oriented countries such as China and North Korea, as well as uh, autocratic countries such as Saudi Arabia, but also the world's largest democracies. India is one. Indonesia is yet another nascent, perhaps, but nevertheless a thriving uh, democratic nation. Now, if you will, let me illustrate some of the common threads amid this diversity. One of these common threads is that a lot of Asian economies have developed with a important stress on what economists call factor accumulation. Now, what's factor accumulation? Well, factors of production are essentially the raw ingredients that go into an economy's production process. We typically think of these as labor, for instance, or when you layer on an educational background to this raw labor, you will have what economists sometimes call human capital. At the same time, you also have physical capital. These are the machines, physical plants, and infrastructure that go into accumulating uh, complementary machinery that can be used for the purposes of production processes. Now, 
all these factors of production went through rapid accumulation during Asia's rapid growth phases. At least for the economies, they have been able to extricate themselves during their development story. So, one example, for instance, is education. If you look at uh, the initial levels of education in the 1950s in, econ in economies in sub-Saharan Africa, that's the second set of columns that you see there, uh, or even in Latin America, which is the third set of columns that you see there, you notice that they started off relatively ahead even of economies in South Asia, which is the fifth column set of columns that you see there, or even in the case of Latin America, East Asia, which is the final set of columns. Now what this means though, is that although they started off relatively ahead, if you look at what has happened by the 2010s, which is the darkest blue columns that you see, you'll see that in many of these Asian regions, they have caught up and in some cases exceeded the performance of these other parts of the world that had started off relatively ahead. So, accumulation of factors of production, at, at least in this case in human capital, is one big part of the story. You also see this in terms of physical capital accumulation. So what you see in Japan is a story of rebuilding after the devastation of the Second World War. But the same story is repeated in a lot of the other Asian economies once they made a decision to pursue a model of factor accumulation, channeling much of their domestic saving into uh, investment, especially investment in physical capital that can be used for, the pr for enhancing the productive capacity of their economies. In the 1960s, um, the then president Park Chung-hye made the decision to pursue a much more export-oriented industrialization strategy, a big part of which entailed channeling much of his, the, South Korea's domestic saving into capital accumulation that could be used to enhance its production for, the, for goods that it would sell in the rest of the world. Of course, if you look at the TVs in your home today or many of the electronic products, you undoubtedly see brands like Samsung or LG, and that is a testament of just how far this South Korean economy has come in terms of accumulating productive capacity in order to produce uh, goods for the rest of the world. That same story also happened in China. If you look at the, the uh, panel on the left, you'll notice uh, that in 1992, what happened was China made a decision. Uh, the then premier at the time, uh, Deng Xiaoping, did his famous southern tour where he looked at a number of southern cities and then he cast his eye further afield looking at Asia, Asian and in particular Chinese diaspora in communities such as Hong Kong and Singapore observing that these diaspora were able to succeed and he made that fateful decision to pursue capital uh, capitalism, socialism, but with chi Chinese characteristics, essentially allowing for a much more capitalistic model to be applied to its economic processes. And you can see clearly from the chart a takeoff in the process of physical capital accumulation in China after that fateful decision. Now if you look at India, you'll see a similar process now playing itself out in 1992. Uh, one, India went through a very significant financial crisis and in the 2000s it then made a decision to open up its economy even more to the rest of the world and you'll see the story of capital accumulation likewise play itself out in India as well. The reality is the proof is in the pudding and if you look at the industrial robots, these are machineries that are used to build other machines, you'll see that two-thirds of the world's industrial robots are located in Asia. Of course, half of that uh, share, two-thirds share, as it turns out, uh, is in China. But you'll see notable shares from Korea and Japan, countries that made capital accumulation a big part of their development story. I will end by pointing to perhaps 
a dark cloud on this horizon. And that is to remind many of us, or for those of us that aren't familiar, that that development story has had occurred in much of Asia with unfortunately very little productivity improvements. Economists have a metric for how you would measure productivity after you strip out all these different contributions from these factors of production. We call that total factor productivity. And if you look at total factor productivity, the story is a lot less bright in some ways. So here you see the annual contribution of total factor productivity growth for the so-called Asian dragons, Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan. And while that contribution does not look too terrible, it's in the twos, with the exception of Singapore, which has almost no total factor productivity growth, you must keep in mind that these were economies growing at the rate of 8, 9, or 10 percent. So economies where total factor productivity growth was only contributing a quarter or even a fifth to its uh, rapid growth story. Now con compare that to other economies in the West and even in Latin America and you see that total factor productivity growth uh, was a much more important contributor to the growth story of these economies during their growth periods in equivalent uh, over an equivalent time span. And here you get a hint of why there is a potential dark cloud and that is unless these Asian economies at least going into the future in the 2030s and the 2040s unless these Asian economies are truly able to ultimately harness the productive capacities of their economy unless they are able to elevate their total factor productivity growth one fears that that rapid growth story will come uh, rapidly crashing down and this might lead to a slowdown in what had been hitherto an impressive growth story for Asian economies. Thank you for taking your time to listen to a little bit of uh, a lecture on Asian economies and hopefully you'll, have the, you'll be sufficiently intrigued and you decide to join us. Thank you very much, Professor Jameis. Another relevant topic to look forward to here at Essex Asia Pacific. And for our last faculty presentation, I am glad to introduce Dr. Peng Shu, Associate Academic Director of Masters in Finance Program. Over to you, Dr. Peng. Thank you, Alia. So now I'm going to share my screen first. Okay, so I assume everybody can see my screen clearly, right? Okay, so welcome to this uh, finance session. I think this is the uh, last session for today, okay? And in this session, we are going to talk about optimizing the capital structure of a company. Okay, so I assume everybody here wants to run a successful company. And one key decision you need to make as a corporate financial manager is to raise your capital successfully. And generally speaking, there are two ways to raise capital, okay? So two fundamental ways to raise capital. All the other uh, fun, uh, financing method is basically a combination of these two, okay? The first one is you can issue debt. The second one is that uh, you can issue equity, okay? And when it comes to debt insurance, they are, you, can issue, you can borrow money from the bank in terms of loans. You can also issue bond. So in today's discussion, I'll use a bond to illustrate the point. Okay, and when you issue equity, basically you sell the shares of a company. Okay, so when you issue that or when you issue bond, essentially you are borrowing money from the investor. Okay, so then when you borrow money from the investor, what do you need to do? Basically, you have a legal obligation to pay back the money at the maturity. Okay, and on the other hand, if you don't pay back the money, what will happen to the company or what will happen to you as owner of the company? The investor can, the borrower, okay, sorry, the lender can sue you for bankruptcy, okay? On the other hand, if let's say you reach your debt capacity, you cannot uh, borrow too much money, or maybe you don't want to run the bankruptcy risk and you don't want to borrow money anymore, another way for you to raise capital is to sell the ownership, okay? So when you sell the ownership, essentially you sell shares of stock, 
Okay, so now let's look at the detailed uh, differences between bond and the stock or debt and equity. Okay, so in terms of issuer, uh, both government and the corporation can issue debt. So you can see, for example, Singapore government issue government bond, US government issue government bond, and the French government issue government bond as well. Okay, and of course, you can see a lot of corporations, big or small, they issue uh, the corporate bond. Okay, so for example, um, if you are in Singapore, Sintel, uh, Sintel, okay, if you are in US, let's say Apple, they all issue corporate bond, right? On the other hand, in terms of equity, because when the company issue equity, they sell the ownership. So only corporations can issue equity, not the government, okay? And when the company issue debt or when the debt issuer issue debt, they not only need to pay back the money uh, before the maturity or uh, on the maturity date, sorry, you, they not only need to pay the debt, um, pay back the debt on the maturity date, but also they need to pay interest on a fixed time period, right? So let's see, maybe it's going to be every six months, you need to pay interest at a fixed rate or a floating rate, or you, can, you need to pay every one year, right? On the other hand, if you have issued a stock, okay, the, the payment you can make to the stockholder is called a dividend. But for this one, you don't have to pay dividend. It's really up to the board of director whether the company want to issue dividend or not, okay? So if, let's say, you think you have a lot of cash and you don't have a lot of growth opportunity, or maybe traditionally your company has issued a lot of dividend every year or every uh, period, maybe you want to issue dividend. On the other hand, if you think, well, your company has a lot of growth opportunity, you want to return all the money or the return the earning for future growth, then maybe you don't have to issue dividend. Okay, so again, you, there is no obligation there. And in terms of the maturity of the security, when the company issues debt, most of the time there is a fixed maturity. For example, the company can issue a short-term bond. Okay, so it can be expiring in three months, in six months, in one year, two years, etc. It can also issue a long-term bond. It can have the maturity of uh, let's say 10 years, 30 years. In US, there's also this so-called century bond. For example, Disney, the issue bond with more than 100 years of maturity. Even though it's a very long uh, term bond, but still it has a maturity. So most of bond has a maturity. There are very few bond that has a uh, uh, infinite life. So for example, in Singapore, I see uh, about 10% of bond issued in the market is called a perpetual bond. That means they don't have maturity, but most of bond has a maturity, okay? But in terms of equity, when the firm issue equity, they don't tell you when they are gonna pay you back the money, right? Or in other, because when you buy a share, you, you own the company, you hope the company is an ongoing concern. You hope the company will never end, right? So that means when you buy shares, it has infinite life or indefinite life at least, okay? And one of the key differences between debt and equity is when you issue debt, you pay interest and interest can help you to save tax. Okay, when the company issue equity, they can pay dividend, but dividend cannot help the company to save tax. Okay, to illustrate this point further, let me use a very simple example. Okay, so now let's look at this simple example. So let's imagine that you are uh, running a company. Let's see uh, a very simple company. So let's assume your company is uh, producing uh, phones, for example, right? Okay, so then obviously when you uh, produce your phones, you are going to sell the phones after the production, you can generate some revenue. Okay, so in order to know how much money or how much profit you have made, you need to minus all the costs, right? So let's assume this year I have a generated revenue of 100 million. Okay, so then let's assume, well, because of labor costs and raw material costs, et cetera, it's gonna be, let's see, 40 million. Okay, so then of course, not only I have all these variable costs, I also have a machine, I have also used a machine, right? So my machine become older, so that means I also have a depreciation. Okay, so let's assume the depreciation is about 20 million. Okay, so that means, roughly speaking, this 100 minus 40 minus 20 is equal to 40 million. So we can call this 40 million operating income. It's the income you generate from operating your business, okay? But then imagine that you have, in order to finance your company, you have borrowed some money, okay? So you have issued some debt. So let's assume the interest you need to pay, let's see, for this year is 10 million, okay? So that means, so this is part of my cost, right? This is part of my financial cost. So I'm gonna minus this 10 million, okay? So then the remaining is 30 million, we call this a taxable income because this is the income you have earned before you pay tax. Or in other words, in most countries for this amount of income, you need to pay tax. 
Okay, so now of course different country will have a different tax rate. For example, in Singapore, the tax rate is about is a seventeen percent. So to make the number easy, let's let's assume the tax rate uh, for my company is twenty percent. Okay, so that means I'm gonna minus thirty million multiplied by twenty percent is gonna be six million. Okay, so then totally this year I'll generate a net income of twenty four million. Okay, so now what can I do with this twenty four million? On one hand, I can return the earning for future growth because maybe I have some good opportunity in the future. I want to use this 24 million to finance my future growth opportunity. Okay, but on the other hand, maybe I don't need all this 24 million, right? So I want to pay some money back to the investor. Okay, so let's assume this year I decide to pay, I decide to keep 40 million in the company for future growth. So we call it return earning. Okay, so then the remaining is going to be 10 million which will be paid out to the investor in, term, in terms of a dividend. To, pay, to be more precise, to pay back to the shareholder in terms of dividend, okay? So now, if you look at this very simple income statement, okay? So then you can see clearly, if the company has issued a debt, okay? So then remember, they need to pay interest and the interest is deducted here. It's before you pay tax. So that means the more money you have borrowed, the more interest you need to pay, the less the taxable income. So that means the less tax you need to pay. Or in other words, if you have issued a debt, the interest expense from the debt can help you to save tax, okay? On the other hand, if you have issued equity, the money you can pay to the investor is called a dividend. But remember this dividend is paid after the tax is paid. So in other words, no matter how much dividend you paid here, you still need to pay the same amount of tax. It does not help you to save tax. Okay, so if we go back to our uh, comparison here, so this is one of the biggest advantage of issuing debt for the company. When the company issue debt, they can save tax because of interest payment. And if they have issue equity, they don't have this benefit. Okay, so then of course, we also, we also want to look at who control the firm, right? Usually, because when you, when you, when a firm issue shares, okay? So they sell the ownership. So the shareholder usually have control over the firm. So how do we control the firm? They have the voting right. So then they can vote for the board of directors. Then the board of directors will name the CEO, the CFO, et cetera. So then they can control, they can manage the firm, right? So there is an exception. If in the case of the firm cannot pay back interest or cannot pay back the principal of their debt, the firm can be sued for bankruptcy, okay? If the firm is sued for bankruptcy, there are several scenarios. It's possible the firm can be liquidated, meaning that all the firm's asset will be sold, will be liquidated. The proceed of the uh, as uh, the proceed from the liquidation will be used to pay the investor. Okay, so who has the highest priority in claiming all this um, proceed? Is the debt holder because remember that she invests all the money to the debt holder, right? So it's the debt holder who has the highest priority in claiming the firm's asset. Okay, if there is anything left then it belongs to the shareholder. If nothing left, the shareholder will just get nothing. Okay, so this is just the first uh, possibility when the firm is sued for bankruptcy. Another possibility, it's also possible for the firm will, will be reorganized or will be restructured. In this case, it's possible the debt holder will become the shareholder. Okay, so in this case, then again, the, share, the, the debt holder, if they become the shareholder, they can have control over the firm as well. Okay, so... The last compare, the last major difference between debt and equity. Remember, when the firm issued debt, they have a legal obligation to pay to the debt holder, right? So that means, okay, so they have to pay a fixed amount to the debt holder, okay? Or in other words, from the debt holder's perspective, their interest is kind of protected. If the firm has lost a lot of money, it's the equity holder who absorb all the losses first. Okay, so that means the debt holder is kind of protected by the equity money, okay? On the other hand, of course, if the firm has made a lot of money, then the debt holder still just receive a fixed amount, which is the principal and the interest payment, okay? But the equity holder get all our potential, okay? So to summarize, the if you buy debt from a company, you, hold, you, ba you basically bear, you bear much less risk. On the other hand, if we bear if you buy the equity of a company, you buy you bear much higher risk. Potentially, you can suffer big loss, but the, potentially you can also make a huge amount of money. Okay, so this is um, the key differences between debt and equity. 
if I summarize here, okay, so generally speaking, the key advantages of issuing debt is you can save tax. This is one of the greatest advantage of issuing debt. Okay, remember when you issue debt, you pay interest, interest can help to save tax. Okay, and one of the biggest disadvantage of issuing debt is there is a um, cost and a risk of a bankruptcy. Okay, so what does this mean? So because the biggest advantage of issuing debt is a tax benefit. So that means if your com company is very profitable, you, you are going to pay tax, right? And or if the tax rate you need to pay is very high, then obviously you want to issue more debt to benefit from tax saving. Okay, so for example, everybody know Apple, right? So Apple is a, one of the largest company in the world. They do have a lot of cash. They don't really need to borrow money, but still a lot of consultants uh, advise Apple to issue debt. Why? Because if Apple issue debt to buy back their uh, equity or buy back their shares, they can save tax. Okay, so this is the idea of, uh, this is one of the biggest advantage of using debt for, comp for a company. On the other hand, the, this, the biggest disadvantage of using debt is the cost and the risk of bankruptcy. So what does this mean? So that means if your company is a um, startup company, if your profit or if your revenue, your earning is not very stable, or if you are a hard tech company, if the, uh, for the hard tech company, your, one of your major investments is in R&D, right? In, case, in the case the company goes bankrupt, most of the investment in R&D will evaporate, right? So that means your bankruptcy cost is very high. Okay, so if your, your company is not a, does not have very stable earning, or if your bankruptcy cost is very high, maybe you don't want to issue a lot of debt. Okay, so this is one of the biggest advantages and disadvantages of using that. And some other concern, uh, consideration of whether I want to use data or not is usually it's quicker for the company to issue debt. Okay, so if I really need money, it's usually quicker for me to get money from issuing debt instead of equity. Okay, so what does this mean? So that means if, let's say, in normal time, I do not have a lot of debt. Then in the crisis, let's say in, in, during COVID, a lot of company um, met a, a liquidity issue, right? They, they don't have enough cash, okay? So if they didn't have enough, uh, if, they, if they didn't borrow a lot of money during normal time, that means they are able to borrow money very quickly during crisis, right? On the other hand, if you have already reached your debt capacity, then during crisis, it's much harder for you to borrow money. Okay, so that's why this is another reason why many companies may not want to issue a lot of debt because they want to maintain this flexibility. In the case of crisis, they are able to raise a lot of debt. Okay, and of course, another consideration when a company uh, consider or when the owner of the company considering uh, consider whether they want to use debt or whether they want to issue equity is remember if they issue shares of stock, that means they sell the ownership. Or in other words, the ownership will be diluted. Okay, so dilution of ownership may or may not be a bad thing for the company, but this is some one of the concern of the founder or of the existing owner of the firm. Okay, so another way to look at uh, debt or equity, whether you want to use debt or whether you want to use equity, is is you can look at the financing choices across the life cycle of a company. Okay, so for most of the company, initially they are a startup, right? So then if they can survive this stage, they are going to expand very quickly. Okay, so then eventually, sooner or later, the company will become mature. Okay, and then depending the uh, how the company is run, they can last for, for a very long time, but then they can also collapse very quickly. But uh, no matter whether it's a uh, 10 year, whether it's a 100 year, 200 year, most company will eventually decline, right? They are going to collapse eventually. So if you look at, um, in terms of life cycle, initially when the company was very young, they tend to use more equity. As I just mentioned, when the company is very young, they don't have a lot of uh, uh, earning. So that means they don't need to pay, they don't need to pay uh, tax anyway. So there's no point for them to issue that to save tax. On the other hand, their earning may not be stable. So there is a high risk of bankruptcy, right? So they may not want to issue a lot of that. But then when the company become more and, uh, more and more mature, okay, on one hand, they can raise, a, they can, they, they, the company itself can generate a lot of profit. So they can use their return earning to finance their future growth. On the other hand, they may want to issue debt to finance their project and also benefit from tax saving. 
Okay, so then eventually when the company collapse, instead of raising capital, it's the time for the co company to pay back the money to the investor, whether it's a debt holder, whether it's a shareholder, because they do, if you don't have good growth opportunity, you don't want to hold the investor's money. If you do this, you are going to destroy the value of the shareholders or the debt holder's money. Okay, so this is the idea. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom to the startup, startup company. Okay, because I know some of you are very interested in how startup companies can raise capital, right? So now let me zoom into the stage of a startup financing. Okay, so generally speaking, if you want to run a successful startup, okay, so there are four stages of a financing. The first one is called the seed funding, then it's early stage equity round, then it's late stage equity round, then it's called, um, then you, you are going to exit, or sometimes it's called a liquidity event. Okay, so let's look at each stage uh, one by one in a bit more detail. So the first part is when the company is really, really young, right? When it's, when it's at its uh, infancy uh, stage, okay? So you just, you just started your company, then obviously you need to raise some capital to start it. But at this stage, you don't need a lot of money because you your product is not really uh, there yet, right? So you are still developing your product. So now how do you raise capital? They are, I'm sure you have heard the so-called three app, right? family, friends, and the four, okay? So basically you use your own money, you use your family's money, you use your friend's money, then you also get money from those, the so-called four who believe that you will become a unicorn in, uh, in the future, right? And typically, uh, not only you get money from your friend, from your family, et cetera, you can also approach the so-called angel investor. They tend to be uh, wealthy people, right? So who has some extra money to invest and also who believe that in the high potential of your company. Okay, so this is for the seed funding. So then the second stage, let's assume that uh, after your initial stage, after, you, um, after your infancy stage, right? Your company is still growing. You are, you are still surviving, right? So then you can reach the second stage which is the so-called early stage equity round. Over here, very often, uh, companies will approach to VC, venture capital, right? They will approach to a venture capital company. If you can persuade the venture capital company to give you the funding, okay, so then you can get funding from them. But the generally speaking, this is not a very, um, it's not like every company can get funding from VC capital because they really look at the potential of the company, right? They look at um, what your business model, your, you know, your total addressable market share, et cetera, okay? And also the, another very important thing to look at is the management team of the company. Okay, so if you cannot reach man, uh, reach fund from the VC uh, companies, you can also do the so-called bootstrapping, meaning that you use the cash flow generally from your company itself. Okay, so this is done by many companies. Okay, so then let's assume after this early stage, okay, you are still surviving, okay? So you have reached several rounds of fund from the VC, okay, the so-called series A, series B, series C, et cetera. Or maybe you have to do bootstrapping. So let's, let's say you are still surviving and your product become more mature. You are growing very fast now. So then you can reach the third stage, which is the so-called late stage equity round. Over here, you are going to see more investors. So for example, sovereign wealth fund, Okay, you are going to see private equity companies. You can also see mutual fund companies, et cetera. Okay, so then let's assume that after this stage, your company is still growing, right? You are still very successful. You are still, you become more and more prosperous. Okay, so then it's time for the initial investors to exit. Okay, so for example, venture capitals, they may want to exit from their initial investment, right? They want they may want to get the fruit of their investment. Okay, so in terms of a, a liquidity event or exit, generally speaking, you can do a public offering. This is one of the most popular way, okay? It, and I'm sure you have heard of IPO, initial public offering. That means you are gonna sell the shares of a stock uh, of the company to the public. Okay, you can get listed in New York Stock Exchange, Singapore Stock Exchange, et cetera. Okay, another way for the company's investor, initial investor to exit is maybe the company is going to be acquired by another company, another big company, right? So for example, if everybody knows Instagram, okay? Instagram was acquired by Facebook, okay? So another possible way, okay? Is maybe some private equity from the company will buy the company out. Okay, which the euro is the so-called leverage buyout or LBO. Okay, so these are the different ways for the company to exit from their uh, deal. Okay, so sorry, this is a different ways for the investor to exit from the deal. 
So of course, as you move from the initial stage to the later stage, the value of the company will become higher and higher. Okay, so these are the different stages for startup financing. So now let's look at what are the instruments you can use in terms of startup financing. Okay, generally speaking, there are two main instruments you can use. Uh, the first one is called a convertible uh, preferred stock. The second one is called uh, convertible debt. Okay, so first of all, let's look at what is a preferred stock. We talked about the stock just now, right? So everybody understands the stock now, I hope. So when you buy stock, you become the shareholder. Right, you become the owner of the company. Similarly, if you you are the investor of a preferred uh, stock of a of a, a startup company, okay, you are also the you also become the owner of the company. But the reason is called the preferred because in addition to ownership, you also you will also have some preferential treatment compared to the common shareholder. The common shareholder are usually the founder or their friend and the family. Okay, so as an investor, let's see, you are going to have some uh, uh, preferential treatment. Okay, so what are the uh, preferential treatment? For example, not only you have the ownership, but also you are gonna sit on the board of the company, right? Okay, so that you can, when the company name a CEO, et cetera, they need to get your approval very often. Okay, and also, for example, um, uh, maybe, um, you know, you have some, they have, you, can, you can impose some restriction on the issuing of more common shares. Okay, so these are the, some of the uh, preferential treatment. Okay, so, on the other hand, okay, if the company has issued a debt, okay, so that means still we already understand the debt, right? It's just a loan to the company, okay? So it's just a loan to the startup. So that means you just lend the money, the investor just lend the money to the company, they don't have voting right, okay? So this is a preferred stock and the debt. So then the second part of this um, jargon is convertible. What does start convertible mean? So for the convertible preferred stock, that means if you buy this preferred stock, you have the right to convert this preferred stock into common stock at a future date. Okay, so of course there are terms and conditions you are going to uh, negotiate there, but essentially you can convert the preferred stock into a common stock. Okay, and then convertible that means in the eventually or uh, later, okay, depending on the conversion or the uh, the trigger, the so called trigger event, you can convert that into equity. Very often it's a preferred stock. Okay, so this is the difference between convertible preferred stock and the convertible debt. Okay, so then in what kind of situation the, the investor will use this one and in what kind of situation the investor will use this one. Okay, so one of the key difference between convertible uh, preferred stock and the convertible debt is if the company is going to issue convertible preferred stock, they must address valuation and ownership questions immediately. Okay, so I'll give you a very simple example, right? So suppose that um, uh, I, I'm the investor, okay? And you are, the, uh, you are the founder of the company, okay? So now I'm going to give you $1 million. Or let's say I'm going to give you a, a smaller amount. I, I'm going to give you 100K, okay? So now I'm going to become the shareholder, right? So you need to tell me how much share or what is the percentage share I'm going to hold, right? It depends on what is the existing value of your company. If, let's see if the existing value of your company, which is the so-called pre-money valuation, okay, if the existing value is one, uh, 100K, so now I give you another 100K, that means I'm going to own 50% of your company, right? On the other hand, if the existing value of your company is 200K, then I give you 100K, so that means I'm going to only own one-third of your company. Right. Okay. So this is the key for convertible preferred share because you become a shareholder. So we need to address the valuation uh, immediately, and then you we are going to decide the ownership precisely. Okay. And then, what is the benefit of this? The benefit of this one is, of course, the trans the the structure of the company is very transparent. Right. So you know you understand the ownership percentage very well. You do the calculation precisely. Okay. However. The problem with this method is, or the problem with this financing um, uh, instrument is, we need to calculate the valuation, but we all know valuation for, for a startup is a very, very challenging, okay? So it requires a lengthy negotiation. So in terms of convertible preferred stock, it takes a month, month to, uh, several months to negotiate, okay? And of course, it incur a uh, higher cost, okay? And, and also in later stage, because startup usually issue different classes of convertible uh, preferred stock with each new funding round. So that means every time the terms and the conditions need to be renegotiated. Okay, so this is the thing. And then when it comes to convertible debt, 
So now suppose instead of uh, buying convertible uh, preferred share from you, I'm just going to lend you the money. I just give you uh, 100K, right? I'm not owning the company yet. So you don't tell me, okay, you don't need to tell me what is the ownership of my investment yet, right? So I just give you 100 million. Okay, so now you can use this 100, sorry, 100K. You can just use this 100K later on, when I'm going to convert my uh, bond into stock, okay, then you are, we are going to talk about the valuation, we are going to talk about the ownership, okay? So the disadvantage of this method is obviously the ownership percentage are not clear. I don't know how much ownership I have at the moment, but the advantage of this one is it's very fast, okay? So you really just take uh, several days to raise a uh, convertible debt, okay? And it's cheaper to execute, and also, once the document are drafted, the company can raise more convertible debt financing at a little additional cost. Okay, so usually um, the convertible debt tend to be used more often during seed financing in early stage. Okay, then in later stage, VC or venture capital investors they tend to use preferred stock in middle or late stage funding round because on one hand. They can have a clear idea of their ownership, right? And also, you know, once they become the preferred shareholder, they have all this pre uh, preferential treatment as well. Okay, if I may summarize, so generally speaking, okay, for most of the companies, there are two fundamental ways to raise capital, debt and equity. Okay, for all for most of the other instruments you can see in the market is a combination of these two basic instrument. Okay, debt and equity. Okay. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Peng. Such valuable insights on finance. I think you are muted. Uh, Sorry about that. Yeah. So uh, as yeah. I was saying, thank you very much, Dr. Peng. Such valuable um, insights on financial capital structure. Thank you very much, Dr. Professor thank Peng. You. Thank you. What a fun, really a fantastic lineup, everyone. So um, a big thank you to all our professors who have joined us today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Please join our next session on Master's Program and Scholarship Showcase, presented, presented by Johnny Liang for the EMBA versus MBA, which one is right for you, presented by Mark Nerva. You can find the link. Yes. Our chat box located at the bottom of your screen. Thank you again, everyone.